A survey that was uh, done not so long ago found out that Malaysians work some of the longest hours uh, in the world. Kale was uh, rated 20, number 21 for average annual working hours in a global survey of cities. So we're right up there in some of the most workaholic uh, cities of the world if we're living in, uh, in, in, in Kuala Lumpur and, uh, and, and living uh, and uh, working in such a uh, a, uh, a work obsessed culture can be really, really challenging, especially when we just finished university and or, or we've just come back from overseas with our with our studies. So, okay. So what we're gonna what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, have a look at what the Bible says about uh, about work uh, and some misconceptions that we might have about work, uh, and uh, and then to think about some practical details along the way of uh, how that affects how we go about. Our, our work. So the first thing that we see in the in the Bible is, of course, that work is is good, right? and the, the goodness of work is seen in the opening chapters of of Genesis. And we're told in uh, Genesis two verses uh, one to three that God Himself uh, is 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 a worker. He he works to create this world that we uh, that we live in, uh, and we're told many times here, right? You know, God finished His work that He uh, had done. Um, uh, he rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So God worked to create the world in which we live. Uh, but even here we see that uh, even though God is a worker and therefore work is good, uh, it's also not ultimate, right? Because at the end of his work, God rests as well. And God's rest is the goal of creation. Uh, rest in the Bible is a picture of God's perfect blessing. Uh, and uh, so work is good, but it's not the ultimate purpose. Of life, and we see that God, in His love, calls humanity both to work and also uh, to rest. Uh, so God doesn't create a finished creation at the start; He creates a creation that's very good. But it's not it's it's not the it's not the you know the garden city of Revelation twenty one where it's full of a you know great multitude from every tribe and nation and language and people. He could have done that if he wanted, but instead what he did was he, he created two people, Adam and Eve, he placed them in a garden and he commanded them to work. And uh, we, we see that in Genesis 2 verse 15, right? God, Lord, God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And this is before the fall. So work is thus good and, and work is a great privilege. Work is one of the ways in, in which we, uh, we reflect the image of God Indeed, we participate uh, in God's purposes uh, for, for creation. Now, we have a habit, I think, often of finding our identity in our work. You know, I think we, we, we ask people, what do you do? And we say, I'm a doctor or I'm an engineer or I'm a lawyer. Or I mean, it's usually those three, isn't it, if you've studied abroad. Um, but we say that as if being a doctor, an engineer or a lawyer uh, is what gives me um, meaning and value in life uh, and that I'm therefore of greater value than a maid or a street sweeper or a cleaner or, or, or someone else. Now, cleaners are very important at the moment, isn't it? Because if people don't clean, we're all going to get COVID-19, right? But the thing is, what, what gives us our, our meaning, our dignity, our value is not what work we do, but who we are, right? That we are people who are made in the image of God and therefore people that work, that's, that, that's what gives us our, our meaning and value, not what we do. Uh, and the Bible also says that the, the, the ability to enjoy our work is a gift of God. So in Ecclesiastes, we, we read this, perceive that there's nothing better for them than to be joyful, to do good as long as they live, also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to men. So work is good. Uh, however, the goodness of work means that it's a prime candidate to become an idol in our life. Uh, if, I mean, if something is not good or is not pleasant or not attractive, you're not going to be tempted to idolize it, are you? Right? We only idolize things because, because they're good. Uh, and an idol is anything that we are tempted to love um, or look to as a source of joy um, satisfaction, security, meaning, 
um, apart from God. Uh, there are many idols that we might be tempted by that are related to work. Uh, there's the idol of success. Um, and I think someone mentioned this just now. Uh, many times people feel that their life is only significant or meaningful if they can achieve something uh, through their work. And as someone else said, often this, this striving begins uh, at school as we seek uh, good marks. Uh, and it can easily continue on uh, into, into our careers. Uh, and so we, we strive at school to get into a particular university and then a particular uh, a career. And then we want to be the, uh, get promotions and we want to be the best. Uh, and we live for the praise of others. And we live for that feeling of significance or importance because I've achieved something uh, through my work. Now, such a drive like that, uh, for success, if you like, can very easily lead to workaholism. Right? Um, for no matter what we have achieved in the past, it always feels like it's not enough. There's something more to achieve. There's someone more successful than me. Uh, and so binding up my identity and value in my work can be very disastrous uh, indeed. I think the second idol, a uh, common one, is to idolize security, uh, working hard. Uh, often leads to the accumulation of, of money and resources. Uh, and it's easy to look for those for that money and resources as a source of security uh, and happiness uh, rather than, uh, than God. Uh, and the quest for that security that, you know, that money brings can then lead someone to work very hard. Thirdly, we might be tempted to idolize comfort. Uh, and like the idol of security, we, we work hard to get more money, but the motivation this time is not so much the security of money, but the pleasure of what money uh, can buy. They talk about the five C's, right, of career, cash, cars, condo, and credit card. And for many people in the world, that's what they're living for, thinking if I have those things, right, then I will have real security, I'll have real happiness, I'll be safe, I'll be comfortable, I won't need to, uh, to worry anymore and i was i was shocked uh, by the power of those those kind of idols when i was in my workplace in my very first job uh i was told if i didn't leave my job then i'd probably be getting a pay rise would i stay and that pull was very strong uh indeed now how do you know whether work has become an idol for you it's the thing about idols is they're not immediately obvious okay? i may still be going to church i may still be uh, even serving in some ministry. Uh, and it won't be obvious straight away that I'm actually living for something else um, rather than Christ. Uh, but in over time, it will be seen. Uh, it'll be seen in our priorities. Uh, and those priorities will take us on a trajectory that is either leading us further and uh, closer to towards Christ or on a trajectory that is leading us away from him. And in the end, that will be seen in our church attendance. It will be seen in our engagement in ministry. It will be seen in our commitment to our personal Bible reading and in many other indicators. Uh, and so we need to keep reminding ourselves uh, that we are Christian before we are in whatever job that we have. Right? It's our identity as the children of God that gives us our significance and value, not my job. Right? My real calling is to serve Christ as the Lord um, of, of my life. So that's the first point. Work is good, but it can easily become uh, an idol. The second point is work is grim, or we might say work is cursed, right? Uh, and because of human sin, the world in which we live is uh, cursed. We see that in, uh, in, in Genesis 3, as God brings the curses, he says uh, uh, to, to Adam, because you've listened to the voice of your wife, eat of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your, of your life. It will bring forth thorns and thistles for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till the, you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And, and that's our common experience of work in this world. right? It's hard. It's long. It's toilsome. Uh, we work with people who are sinful. Uh, it, we, we, we face all kinds of problems. Uh, we don't always achieve what we hope to achieve. Uh, we find that our company cares more about profits than or people, or we work hard on a project for a year and it's cancelled because of COVID-19. Uh, 
so many ways our work feels futile, it feels cursed. And this toilsomeness of work is not an accident. Uh, it's part of God's deliberate design. Uh, because in our, in our sinfulness, we look to idols for, to, for satisfaction and meaning apart from God. And God in his judgment will not allow us to find the satisfaction and joy and meaning that we're looking for in those idols. They will always disappoint us. Now, we do live in a fallen world. We may on occasion find a job that we actually enjoy. Yeah? If that's the case, that's a gift of God. That's a wonderful thing, right? But the Bible says it's a gift of God to enjoy your work. I think that implies that most of the time you won't, right? Uh, the norm is toil. And that's why the writer to, of Ecclesiastes begins his book the way that he does, right? Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? Implied answer? Nothing at all. Sim see a similar thing in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Let's just pick up verse 22. What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? All his days are full of sorrow and his work is a vexation. Even in the night, his heart does not rest. This also is his vanity. So the work is difficult, it's tiresome, it's toilsome. You go home at night, you can't sleep because you're still thinking about your work. Uh, it's vanity, it's meaningless. And it's really crucial that we understand this. Because so long as we think that we are going to find our meaning and significance in our work or our career, we're going to be bitterly disappointed uh, with life. Work, money, career, they will never give us the lasting joy satisfaction and security uh, that we want instead we'll be struck again and again with the with the toilsomeness the meaninglessness of work and that by the way is why people move from job to job to job always in search of something better uh, and it often ends up being just the same yeah? and the most meaningless thing of course is that we're all going to die one day uh, and when we die no one will remember our achievements uh, and in fact, all that we've worked for, um, the money might be given to someone else who squanders it, um, and everything will be, will be futile in the end. Now, all this is to show that we're actually made for something much more um, than, than work. We're made for relationship with God. So that's the third point. Work is, is redeemed. Uh, so thankfully, it's not all bad news. And the coming of Christ makes a difference to our work. Jesus dies on the cross. He deals with our sin. He's raised again as Lord. And he brings us into a restored relationship with God. And in that reconciled relationship with God, uh, we can now serve God in our work um, as we work for the Lord. Right? Uh, whatever we do, uh, we do it in the name of, of, of Christ. You see that in verse 17. Whatever you do, uh, whether in, uh, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So whatever we do, and he mentions here marriages, so wives and husbands, he mentions fathers and children, uh, and then he'll go on to talk about his work. In all of these things, we actually can honour and, and serve the Lord. And Paul shows what it looks like for us to serve the Lord in, in Colossians 3, verse uh, 22 to to 25 this is bond servants obey in everything those who are your earthly masters not by way of eye service as people pleases but with sincerity of heart fearing the lord what, whatever you do work heartily as for the lord and not for men knowing that from the lord you'll receive the inheritance as your reward you are serving the lord christ for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he's done there's no partiality Masters, treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. So we have a new goal at work. It's godliness. You see that in verse 22. Uh, Obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleases, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. So we are to work with sincerity, with diligence. We are to work with integrity. Uh, we are to to work when our boss is looking and when he is not. Uh, as Christians, we serve God when we refuse to, to lie, when we refuse to participate in deceit or 
uh, corrupt practices of our, of our company. We serve God when we genuinely seek the best interest for our customers, our clients, our colleagues, and even the company that we work in. Uh, we serve the Lord when we work hard with diligence and with care. Uh, we serve God in our work as we seek to be godly as workers. Uh, notice also we have a new master at work. We're not just serving uh, our boss. We're serving Jesus. Verse 23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. So we are to work as if we're working for Jesus. And we are to work because we want to please him. Not just to keep our boss happy or our supervisor happy, but because we want to keep make Christ happy. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to be workaholics. Right? Because we're called to serve Christ in every part of our life, not just our work. Uh, being a workaholic is not pleasing to Christ. Right? Because if you're a workaholic, you're going to work hard at work and you're not going to love your family, your church, or your community. Right? Uh, no, we won't be workaholics. But what it does mean is that we will work diligently when, whether the boss is around or he's not. Uh, we won't be you know, working when he's looking and Facebook when he's not. Uh, we won't just be staying back long hours to impress our boss or our, our colleagues, but then slack off when he's on holidays. Uh, we will be diligent all the time. Uh, thirdly, we see we have a new reward for our work. So we have a new uh, goal at work, godliness, a new master at work, Jesus. We have a new reward for our work, uh, and that is a heavenly inheritance. You see that verse 24, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back. For the wrong he's done, there's no partiality. So as, as Christians, we're working not just for money. We're working for a heavenly inheritance now i'm not talking about uh, you know you work hard and you'll earn your way to heaven through your good works uh, that's not what the bible teaches at all i think what this is saying is that as, as we live out the gospel as we show jesus to to be the lord of our life that demonstrates that we are christians and that we're headed for heaven right in the same way that the non-christian shows that they are not christians by the way that they work right so we're work, uh, we, we, as, we, uh, as we work, we are working for a heavenly reward as we live out our, our Christian, Christian life. Now, there are many other passages that we could, uh, we could look at here, and I'll just give you a brief summary of them all. Right? 1 Thessalonians talks about how we should work so that uh, we won't um, be a burden on others. Uh, part, of, uh, uh, part of loving others is... Uh, is seeking to have our own income rather than just living off our parents all the time. That doesn't say that we'll never be dependent on others any time in our life. We will, right? But we shouldn't deliberately be dependent on others. We should be diligent and we should work. Uh, we should work so that we have money to, to share uh, with those in need. Uh, Ephesians 4.28. Uh, 1 uh, Peter 2.18 uh, says that we should be subject to our masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust, right? So you serve well in your company, whether or not you have a good boss or not, right? Uh, it's a gracious thing to endure suffering at work, right? Uh, it's it, doing what is right and entrusting ourselves to God is a good thing to do. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 3 uh, warns us against idleness. Uh, James chapter 5 uh, reminds us that God sees injustice and, and acts on it, like when work, bosses don't pay the wages of their uh, of their workers, and, and Proverbs 6 warns us against laziness. Right? Now, all of those things, uh, what matters is not so much what job we have, but who we are, our character, and who we're serving. Uh, you know, the, are we serving the world or are we serving Christ? Okay, uh, and there's a sec second way that we can serve God in our work, and that is uh, as we do the work of the Lord. So we can work for the Lord as we uh, live in integrity and godliness at, at work, but we can also do the work uh, of the Lord uh, as, as well. Now, it's important to, to, for us to understand that the work, uh, our work for the Lord won't last. 
right? 2 Peter 3 reminds us that this world is going to be destroyed, right? So if you made a bridge, right, or you made a painting, or you made the perfect set of financial accounts, if that uh, ever existed in the first place, right, those things are not carrying on into the new creation, right? And that's the point of Ecclesiastes. It doesn't mean that our, our work for the Lord is, 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 is not valuable or important. It is. Right? Uh, the way we work, the way we love others with our work, our integrity, all of these things honors the Lord. But it doesn't mean that our work is going to last into the future. Right? But there is one kind of work that will last, and that is the work of the Lord. The work of the Lord. We read about it in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So there is a new and there's a greater work for Christians to do, not just creation work, uh, but the work of redemption. This is the work of proclaiming the gospel to others. And uh, we know that this is the work that, uh, that uh, Paul is talking about, uh, if we just looked at the following chapter, chapter 16, verse 10, Paul says, when Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord as I am. So Paul is doing the work of the Lord. Timothy is doing the work of the Lord. What is the work that they are doing? It's the work of proclaiming the gospel. Right? And Paul writes to the Corinthian church and he says to, to, the, to that church, to all Christians, always be abounding in the work of the Lord, right? Your creation work, it will be vain, in vain in the end, right? But your work of the, of the Lord will not be in vain. And now if we had more time, we can look at uh, some of John's gospel. We can see how this is the work that Jesus was doing, um, how he's bringing people from death to life uh, and, and so on. But I, I think we'll just leave it, leave it here for, uh, for now. Uh, uh, yeah, so I thought we'll, I'll just share a little bit about my own experiences. Um, and I think, um, let me just, yeah, so just by way of background, um, I've been working for, for, for five years now. Um, so I'm currently in the nonprofit NGO sector. Um, been here, I guess, in the same sector since I started working. Um, so looking back at when I first started working, I think the greatest adjustment, uh, in, in my life and I think in any young adult's life is, is transitioning from studying to working because it's just a very different dynamic, uh, from, from just the, the hours you spend, um, you know, there's a lot more independence in that sense as a student compared to, um, uh, a working adult. Um, you, you, you feel like you appreciate you appreciate weekends more uh first of all uh and and just have very little time uh outside of um work um uh, because if you think about it most of our lives uh, act well active lives will be spent on um uh, on working um and and be it in the office or or otherwise um uh and so i i think i when i first started it was I felt physically tired all the time and then I just had to adjust in a lot of ways. Um, socially, for example, I uh, had to adjust, readjust to form new relationships and new communities at work, um, especially one that is Christ-centered uh, without participating in any sort of office gossip and politics. is very easy to be pulled in in that sense. Um, and uh, the most difficult one that I have, I struggle with and I still struggle with today sometimes even more so now than before because I just have more responsibilities now um is to not overwork so uh Tim was talking um about that and and I completely agree and I completely um, still relate and and still feel convicted till today um I think I find a lot of value and my identity in what I do and how I um, act and and the, I guess my achievements um like a lot of what what you some of you were saying um and uh this is not just at at my job uh it's also at church and other other ways I think I find that I have this desire uh or this uh yeah th this pride I guess uh, this desire to um um to feel like I'm um 
I guess, valued of I feel important or uh, I want to please people in that sense. And so I think that's why I, I put a lot of value in, in what I do. Um, and so, um, again, like what Tim said, I, I think I... I do think that it's a good thing to work, uh, but it's so easy to get absorbed into, into work um, that I forget what, uh, about why I work. So um, like Tim said, I also, it's a gift to enjoy um, working. And I think I have that. I'm thankful to God for that. Um, but it's also a danger in that sense that because I enjoy working that I just tend to think, oh, it's okay to overwork. Or it's okay to be a workaholic. Uh, as long as I, uh, you know, I still attend church, it's fine, you know, um, that you kind of forget that there are other, other signs as well, like, I guess, um, neglecting my Bible reading uh, and all that. Um, and I think um, a good litmus test sometimes is uh, to know whether or not you are, you take pride in your work or you, you, um, um, you idolize your work is, is, uh, whether you are afraid of losing it. Uh, so I think I realized that I was afraid of losing my um, job because I felt like I would lose a p- big part of my identity. Because <laughs> uh, I mean, a lot of times we do introduce ourselves by what we do. Uh, you know, nobody really, not that I know of, really says, hi, my name is, uh, and I am a child of God. You know, it's like way out there for a lot of people. It's like, what? <laughs> um, but that is true. We are. Um, I mean, I am a daughter of Christ, but I don't say that because I think it's, uh, you know, frowned upon or, or people will think it's weird. People will actually kind of find more interest in what you do. Uh, and so I think it's gotten better over time, this, this idol of, um, and this, this sin of pride and, and idling my work. Um, I think what helps really is to be reminded of the gospel. Um, and through the word of God and through Christ and the community. So uh, being in a church that reminds you every single week that, you know, um, what is what really matters. And, um, and in fact, actually it helps me to embrace the failures in my work. You know, how I, if I fail in doing that task or if I fail in not meeting expectations, um, I now have come to embrace them <laughs> in the sense that... Um, because I, I, I'm reminded that the, those failures and those sin in my life and the depravity of mankind, depravity in my life, actually um, ultimately points that, you know, we can't be self-sustained or we can't, we can't sustain ourselves and we need to depend on Christ and the gospel. And, and it just makes the good news so, so, so much better and, uh, and, and the gospel so much more precious to know that um, I am still a sinner and I, I still struggle with these things. Uh, even though it seems like, oh, it's fine, you know, you're overworking and you're, it's just pride, like it's not a big deal. But I, I think that's the danger there, that, that we forget that uh, because society and, and I guess the world and your, even our families um, approve of uh, overworking or approve of of working hard because that proves that you are useful to society, that it's easy to forget that that is also a form of, um, of, of sin or a form of um, the enemy taking us away from God um, slowly. Um, so I think, um, yeah, just to recap, being, being part of a community really, really helps. Um, every week I'm reminded of why I... Um, why the gospel is so precious. Yeah. Mm. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you for the sharing. Yeah. Uh, we all have much more to say than we have time for. So uh, now if you want to ask questions, you can put them in the chat now if you want, or there will be the Q&A at the end of the day. So you can also ask them there as well. I'll be on the panel. You can ask the question in the big group. Um, now the next part, we're really just going to touch it in dot points, but I hope to just uh, burst a couple of uh, false understandings of, uh, of work and uh, hopefully this will get you thinking um, uh, about a right view of work. So there's uh, five common traps right, that uh, Christians often fall into um, as they misunderstand what work is about. So the first one is to think that I'm called to a particular profession 
Uh, it's very common for Christians to speak in this way. Uh, and usually the career that they feel called to is, as I said, to be a doctor, an engineer, or a lawyer, right? Um, but if we examine what the scriptures say about our calling, we'll discover that it has absolutely nothing to do uh, with a particular career or, for that matter, being called to full-time ministry or any, any other activity, right? So in the Bible, uh, we are called to Christ and his kingdom. So we're, we're called to become Christians, in other words, to, to belong to the kingdom of God. Right? Uh, God calls us that to that through the gospel. We're called to be holy, right? Uh, as God is holy, because we're his people. We're meant to be like him. We are called to suffer. Um, that's probably not the most uh, uh, happy thing that we realize that we've been called to, but we have been called to suffer. Right? Um, we have been called to heaven, right? Uh, God is, is bringing us to heaven to be with him. And that is a very common way in which the language of calling is used. Now, there, there, of course, there are various other uh, ones that we can talk about. Uh, and some that are of no significance where the Bible says, you know, that this place was called this, um, right? But uh, there's a guy called Michael Bennett who has written a book and uh, called Do You Feel Called by God? And this is a summary, essentially, of what he found in the book, right? He said, in summary, based on the 300 plus uses of the word call as they relate to the church period following the ministries of Jesus and the apostles, you and I are called by God in two ways. First, we are called to be Christians, to be disciples of Jesus. Second, we are called to be holy, to grow in Christ's likeness. If we accept these two statements, then I believe answers to all the other questions about guidance and vocation will be much more straightforward. But let me say one more time that the concept of feeling called to some particular Christian service finds no support within Scripture. Right? So we're never called... Uh, to a career, right? You will not find a verse in the Bible that says that God thinks that lawyers and doctors are more important or more God-honoring professions than being a cleaner or a maid or something else, right? Um, I mean, it, it, you've never heard anyone say, right, I feel called to be a garbage collector. Right? You've never heard that before, right? But oh, I feel called to be a gardener. But does God not need garbage collectors or bus drivers or people at border security? Surely those are very important jobs. Right? Uh, we only speak of the glamorous ones. Uh, so I think that alerts what is, can often happen is that we can, uh, we can justify living out our worldly fleshly desires by putting a Christian label on it um, to justify it. Uh, and sometimes you even find it taught in churches by pastors. Right? But it is actually worldly teaching. It's not Christian teaching. Uh, secondly, uh, the second trap is we think that glorifying God at work is about excellence. Now, we looked at a verse earlier from Colossians 3. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Right? Uh, so the, the Bible encourages us to work hard, right? to work heartily, to be diligent in our work. And yes, we do honor God when we're diligent in our work. It doesn't honor God when we're lazy. Right? We do honor God when we're sincere. Right? But the problem is that the verse doesn't say, uh, that you glorify God by being excellent or you glorify God by being the best, right? God requires us to be faithful. He doesn't require us to be the best. Um, you don't need to be the best doc doctor. You can refer someone else to the best, to, to the person who's the best doctor. And faithfulness as a Christian means that we're faithful in all parts of life, not just in, uh, in one. And so I don't think it really is God honoring to be the best doctor, but have no time to disciple my children, to have patchy church attendance, to have little time for my personal Bible reading uh, and prayer. And the truth is, if you invest in, overinvest in one part of life, all the other parts of life will suffer. And God wants us to honor him in all of our life and not just um, in a part of it. So uh, that's a false view of work, um, that it's about excellence. Thirdly, uh, false, third false view, being a good witness means doing what everyone else does. So I think to myself, if I'm going to be a good witness to my colleague, then I need to be like them. I need to stay back at work because, you know, what will they think of me if I'm a Christian and I go home from work on time, right? And, you know, they'll think I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm being unloving to the team. Now, of course, there's a good motive in that kind of thinking, right? Um, but the thing is, unless my life is distinctively Christian, 
unless I can show my colleagues that my values are different to theirs because I'm Christian, I will never be an effective witness in the workplace. What motivation will there be for them to become Christian if I'm just the same as them? So the fourth one, climbing the career ladder will mean I'm better able to serve God. Um, I think we see that when we have evangelistic events and we, you know, we get out the famous politician or a famous banker or whoever it is to give the talk, um, to think that that will be more impressive to the world. Or we think if I rise up the career ladder, then I'll have more money or have more influence. Um, and that will mean I'm better able to serve God. Right? And, and that's a deception right? because, uh, every with every uh, promotion or every pay rise there's also costs as well right it'll cost your time uh, it may cost you in other ways as well you know, your family um, or temptation that you face or many other things right? and, and fifthly uh the, the fifth false view is the work that i do in this world will last uh, into eternity i mean there's a famous book on a uh, work called uh, Every Good Endeavor by Tim Keller. And this view is kind of promoted in that, that book. Now, I love Tim Keller. He's a great guy. Uh, you should buy his books. You should read them. There's lots of helpful things in there. And you should listen to his preaching because Tim Keller is awesome, right? But in this book on Every Good Endeavor, uh, uh, he, he's trying to add meaning to our work. But one of the ways he oversteps it a bit is to say that our work will carry on into eternity. No, our work won't carry on. As I said, it will, this world will be destroyed. Uh, the work that will carry on into eternity is the work of the Lord uh, and not our work for, for the Lord. So uh, three reasons that we do work. Then if those are five false views, what are three, uh, uh, three reasons we do work? Number one, we work to feed ourselves and our family and to not be a burden on others. We saw that earlier. Uh, in 2 Thessalonians 3 says, if someone won't uh, work, let him not eat. Okay. Now, it doesn't say what job you should do. Um, there are some people who, who study abroad um, and then they want to get a job in their profession, but it, it's really hard to find a job in the particular profession that they trained in. And so they just stay at home and, um, and, 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 and don't work and live off their, continue living off their parents' money, right? Um, you know, that, that's not a, a God-honoring thing to do, right? The Bible says if you won't work, don't you know you you don't eat right so um some of us need to just get any job whether it's at the supermarket or whether it's at a different profession from what we trained in um okay great if i can get a job in my profession and use what i've learned that's wonderful right but i i i, I don't want to use uh, excuses to be lazy and to be a burden to others that i'm meant to be caring for uh secondly uh now uh, should i just add here as well that uh doesn't mean that you'll always be able to get a job right i mean we live in fairly difficult times right now and maybe your work right now is looking for a job um yeah secondly uh we work to support gospel ministry which helps keeps us christian so we earn money from our work uh and part of that money is given to serve gospel ministry right and as we invest in we support people to preach the gospel they preach the gospel to us that's going to keep us christian as well isn't it we're going to benefit from that so that's an important thing that we should use with our money. Uh, and then thirdly, of course, we work to make Christ known. As we're in the workplace, as we live these distinctively Christian lives in integrity and sincerity, we also look for opportunities to share the gospel with others. Um, and that's really um, uh, what it's about in the end, is, is bringing people uh, to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so you can see on your outline then, well, there's three ways that you can think about your work, right? You can think about it as a job, you can think about it as a career, or you can think about it as a calling. Now, that word's being used incorrectly, so that's why it's in quotation marks, right? Um, as a vocation, right? So a job, something that you, you, you do to earn money to live. People say, if you think of your work in that way, you'll be happy, right? Um, or you can look at it as a career, right? something that you're looking for meaning, significance uh, in, right? They say you'll be unhappy. Um, or you can look at it as a calling, something that you'd love to do anyway. So here's people who are working as, you know, they just love painting and then they work as a painter and you know, they just feel uh, very happy about it. So those are the three ways that uh, you can think about work. I wonder which one of those you think uh, a Christian uh, should have.
Now, normally we will think um, we speak in the language of Korea all the time, don't we? I mean, I, I hope I've been able to show you that the whole concept or idea of a career is actually not Christian, right? Because um, the whole idea of a career is finding your meaning and significance in your work, but that's not what should give us meaning and significance to our lives. That's actually idolatry, right? So Christians should have jobs, right? Um, it's something that we do, but it's not who we are, right? Um, that's how we should think about our work. So another way of putting that, number one, this comes from, a, a, from a Philip Jensen, um, who wrote a book, Guidance and the Voice of God. Um, this concept comes from that book. Uh, one, we work to live, we don't live to work. Second, we live to minister Christ, we live to serve Christ. Uh, and thirdly, we may give up our work to serve Christ, um, i.e. full-time ministry or something like that. Right? Or we reduce our hours so that we can spend more time in church or something like that. Right? So we work to live, not live to work. We live to serve Christ and we may give up work to serve Christ um, if people will support us to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the last, the last point then really is uh, as, you, as you go to work, the fundamental decision you need to make is to think about uh, who you are going to serve. Um, and are you going to serve yourself? You're going to serve your company, or you're going to serve Christ, right? Um, and that question will will come. That decision will come out in a million different ways. You know, uh, will I stay back at work again uh, and miss another Bible study, or will I go home and then go to Bible study? Right? Or uh, will I take this promotion that's going to make me travel everywhere? Which we can't really travel now anyway. But theoretically, if you could travel, right, then we take that uh, or you refuse it so you can still keep teaching Sunday school in church. And, or are you going to be honest at work? Or are you going to go along with the corrupt practices of the company? Or are you going to declare your faith in Christ? Or are you going to be silent in the workplace? There'd be a million ways where this decision is played out. Right? I, am I going to serve Christ or am I not um, uh, in my work? Uh, and, if I can put it this way, there's two things we want to be doing. We want to be bringing Christ to work. We want to be godly um, people as, as we work. There's the decision. Am I going to be a godly worker who, who lives in truth and integrity and love, and faithfulness, or am I not? Am I going to bend to whatever company culture is there? And am I going to work, bring workers uh, to Christ? Am I going to see it as probably the most important thing I can do in my work? is actually to build relationships with my colleagues um, and to look for opportunities to share the good news of the gospel with them uh, and, to, uh, and to, to bring them uh, to, to church and to Christ. Um, now, the truth is, if, if you choose to put Jesus first in your work, there's always going to be ways that you're going to miss out. There's always going to be ways that you suffer. and um, and, and Chris has reminded us of some of that earlier today. But in the light of eternity, um, that's the right way to live, isn't it? It's a gracious thing. It's a blessed thing to be able to follow Christ um, in this path of suffering to glory. I think if you are looking for your first job and you haven't started work yet, then I think it's really important how you start, right? Um, Make sure you let people know early on that you're Christian. It's harder to do it later on. Um, think about how to manage the pressures to overwork. Um, pursue a Christian network who will hold you accountable, preferably in the workplace itself, if you can find another Christian there that you can maybe pray with on a Friday lunchtime. That would be a great thing to do. Um, think through what you do with your money. And uh, it might be the first time you've ever had significant money in your life. Um, and Think about what you'll do with it um, so that you won't uh, give in to greed. And, uh, yeah, and, uh, uh, yeah, think about how you will actively participate in your workplace as in a distinctively Christian way, which may be different to your company's values, but um, is living out what the scriptures say. Um, now, I'll, I'll send around an article later that you can, you can read that has... Uh, 
you know, and, and some, has some resources and things like that. We couldn't fit it in the booklet, but I'll share it with you later on. Uh, and you can, you can maybe pick up one of those books if you, you want to find out more. Okay, we're out of time. So, uh, Audrey, would you like to lead us sure. in prayer? Or? Yeah. Yes, I'll pray for us. Yeah. Great. Dear Holy Father, uh, thank you so much that, uh, again, you have convicted us uh, in this uh, matter um, and that uh, you've shown us, oh Lord, that there are a lot of myths out there um, and that uh, they're not true to your word, oh Lord. So Father, we ask that um, as each and every one of us think about this, uh, you help us to see um, all this in light of our own lives um, and how can we change how we are living uh, or how we make decisions in our lives um, right now or in the future and, and in the future as well um, so that we can uh, live lives that's pleasing to you, Lord. Um, we ask that um, as uh, for, for those especially who are struggling uh, with um, looking for employment and, and looking for work right now, Lord, uh, we ask that they uh, indeed depend on you and uh, place all the anxieties on you and that... Um, and that ultimately, they see that uh, the, um, the work uh, for your kingdom uh, in, in their own lives uh, through, through personal evangelism, through sharing of your gospel, uh, through uh, supporting uh, their friends and family and also the church. Um, ultimately, that, has, that is the one that has eternal value and that, has, um, that, that contributes to building your kingdom, oh Lord. And so we ask that you give us that desire and the joy and zeal to do that work. Uh, wherever we are. Um, and Father, we also ask that you help us to see that um, all work is good, O oh Lord, and how you've created them. Um, and help us to um, also create boundaries in our work, um, in our lives, so that we are able to um, and to continue um, living for you uh, in our workplaces and also uh, in our own lives. Uh, we ask this, all this interesting. Amen. Amen. Amen.